Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Omar, for the incredibly important work that you and all members of FOBZU have done and are doing in championing the right to education for Palestinians and building bridges of solidarity between London and Palestine. It is my pleasure and honor to be chairing this event, which we're hosting. Our outstanding scholar and dear friend, Professor Omar al-Shahabi, who will speak uh, for about 30 to 40 minutes, and after which we're going to open the floor. Omar is the director of the Gulf Center for Development Policies, and he is also an associate professor in political economy at the Gulf University for Science and Technology. He completed his DPhil in economics at Pembroke College, Oxford, and previously worked at the IMF, the World Bank, and McKinsey, and he's also lectured at University College, Oxford. His latest book in English, Contestant Modernity, Sectarianism, Nationalism, and Colonialism in Bahrain, was released in 2019. Um, with One World Publications, and he's also a senior advisor to FOBZU. His earlier book, which was published in Arabic, was titled Exporting Wealth and Entrenching Alienation, a History of Production of the GCC. It is an interdisciplinary tour de force that tackles big questions about the political and social relationships shaping and being shaped by the mode of economic production prevalent in Gulf states. Omar's bilingual publications, his mastery of the context of global and regional politics, his critical scholarship, and unlike many of us, his actual residence and work in the Arab world, following his education abroad, puts him, in my view, in a unique position to speak about today's topic. Last but not least, I should share a detail about Omar. This is decolonization now, is in fashion, it's a trend. And uh, one of the, uh, maybe if somebody decides to decolonize James Bond and wants to produce Omar 007, I just learned that he likes his rice fried, not steamed. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Dr. Professor Omar al-Shahabi. Okay, well, thank you very much. And thank you very much, Hisham, for that great introduction. And I want to begin by uh, thanking uh, Friends of Birzeit University and the University and College Union and the National Education Union. And yeah, I'd like to begin by expressing solidarity and thanks with those uh, fighting for better conditions for those who work in higher education and research. Um, you're not only fighting for yourselves and those in this country, you're also doing it, I think, for everyone around the world who works in higher education. So, I was today, well, when I uh, told Omar that I was coming a few weeks ago, he uh, said the title of the talk is Beyond Decolonization, Liberating the Study of the Arab World from the Gulf to Palestine. So, you know, bring together decolonization, liberation movements, the Gulf and Palestine, and the past and the present. So, you know, in the beginning I was like, okay, this, this needs a bit of thought of how, how to do this. <laughs> Uh, but, th but then I realized these are actually issues that are very close, I think, to me. And uh, uh, what I engage with bo both in my work and otherwise, and have been motivating forces uh, in my work and in most of my adult uh, life, really. I mean, as, as was mentioned, I work in a university back in the Gulf, uh, the Gulf University in Kuwait, and also in a research uh, center focusing on critical social studies of the Gulf. Most of my uh, university education, in fact, all of my university of education was here in England and in English. And uh, indeed, uh, that's, that was most of my exposure uh, in academia uh, until I went back uh, home. And the university I teach in now is also largely uh, in English. Um, and, you know, there is actually a word we use in the Gulf to describe those whose primary language and culture is, uh, is in English and is Western oriented, which is usually called as in chicken nuggets, uh, which symbolizes McDonald's uh, and also that it's brown from the outside and white from the inside. Uh, so this is part of my constitution. A lot of my involvement as well in Palestine related uh, work and readings also happened while I was here in England, uh, something which I'll come back to later on. Uh, and indeed continues with organizations uh, such as FOBZU uh, today. Now, the center's work, however, and the focus of most of my research and uh, 
I think most of uh, my general orientation, and indeed where I feel culturally and personally at home, is in Arabic. And this is indeed where most of, uh, I think most of the work we try to do has an impact and reaches a wider group of people in the region. Now this kind of, the two worlds, I guess, if you want, that I, that I have worked in between meant different challenges and focuses. So for example, uh, here, the, the research is very methodical and voluminous and within established research institutions with an entrenched history of hundreds of years. Um, by also dealing with issues of epistemology that will come up and we will talk about later, about how representation and about how to approach different subjects. While on the other hand, maybe back home and in the work we do in the center, the, and people who work generally in the region and in Arabic maybe have their uh, you know, ears more to the ground on what ha is happening there, but also suffer from lack of systematic, uh, on, um, basically entrenched institutions. It's mainly more based on individual efforts and interest, which might reach a wider audience, but again, they face these institutional issues, uh, which sometimes obviously could reach the point of censorship or even imprisonment, as has happened to some of our colleagues. Um, and again, also a lot of the work I do in Palestine uh, back home is within these uh, issues. So these tensions between the discourse, language, and methods of teaching, and uh, ways of work between here and those back home, uh, and how to approach work on the Gulf and Western universities and back home, uh, will be basically some of the issues that we will try to uh, illuminate today. So this will be a bit of a tour, including personal thoughts, uh, some academic, uh, I guess, also uh, some of my academic work, and we'll, we'll keep switching between the past and the present. So I ask you to you know, bear with me a bit, um, but the overall, basically, thrust will be, how can the colonial experience shed light on Arab traditions of liberation that link the Gulf to Palestine, and how can this inform discussions of decolonization and solidarity? Now it is in the West and also uh, in the Gulf. So I will try to basically uh, connect these with a wide range of subjects, including the British imperial imprint in the Gulf, the anti-colonial movements and their, that emerged, and their linkages to the Palestinian uh, liberation struggle in order to explore how their traditions can inform today's conversation on Palestinian solidarity in the West, in the Gulf, and the wider Arab world. So I will start with, uh, by, I guess since we're, uh, the first word was decolonization, I will start with looking at the relationship uh, of colonialism to the Gulf and how this can inform our discussion. Now the Gulf uh, might not come to uh, news uh, to many of you, has a large colonial imprint. Now, but what usually this has meant in terms of focus uh, is looking at the international how the international relations of the Gulf has been influenced through this process and how basically the Gulf has come to be under the influence of the Western, what's usually called, I guess, the Western sphere. Uh, so usually this starts with you know, discussing the treaties that uh, Britain uh, con uh, concluded uh, with different Gulf rulers starting in 1798 and then 1820, up until this changed into US hegemony that ch continues until the, uh, today in one way or another in the region. But what is not talked about is how, as also is the large imprint this has left internally within the societies uh, of the Gulf, which is what I would like to talk a bit uh, about today. Um, so a lot of my research in English has focused on uh, how the colonial experience has played a part in uh, a lot of the structures that still exist today in the modern Gulf. So I've argue, argued elsewhere that the kafala sponsorship system uh, of uh, migrant labor workers was a product of the British colonial experience in the early 20th century and how this has uh, continuations up until today. I've also looked at how modernized absolutism, the system of rule that I think also continues uh, until today, uh, was also born early in the, first, uh, in the early 20th century, uh, and specifically in Bahrain, when Britain deposed the previous ruler in 1923 and wanted to establish a new rationalized form of uh, absolutist rule. 
uh, modeled on the India princely states, which then also spread across the region. So, you know, against this idea that it is a very age old form of ancient uh, rule. Also, important uh, that I've tried to focus on is also in terms of the outlook and how the Gulf is perceived and approached within Western academia and studied today. Uh, and this has indeed has seeped um, into the wider, I guess, discourse uh, on the Gulf. And this is, I think, what I would like to focus on for this uh, first part now. <clears throat> indeed, I think in many ways, maybe the Gulf is uh, probably the last great bastion of Orientalism in, in the Middle East studies. Um, now, I think obviously this also exists in other parts of the Arab world when studying the Arab world and other parts uh, of the world, but there have also been a lot of changes and nuances and uh, attempts to address this. Uh, and I think when uh, trying to approach other uh, areas and their study. In the Gulf, however, I think it persists heavily and it's probably the default. It's still the modus uh, operandi, I guess, as it's called. So the, you know, the region is, is mainly th still th uh, seen through the prism of oil, monarchs, US, US, UK security relations, or in the case of the leftist discourse, imperialism, and ethno-sectarianism. And it's this last one which I will start our discussion with today. Uh, now, ethno-sect categories and using them as the basis from what to uh, analyze is very prevalent when dealing with the Gulf, with the Gulf in academia today. Uh, and it has become part of the discourse and talked about in a way that I think nowadays, if you talk the same about other places, would be rejected and would, not be, would be seen as too simplistic and not being... Uh, a way to approach it. This is not something that is uh, an issue of the right, by the way, only. Indeed, many people are uh, labeled usually as being part of the left or as progressives also uh, sometimes engage in this. Uh, and indeed, I suspect maybe a large proportion, uh, maybe a majority that of maybe who are here in this room would consider themselves to hold more progressive or uh, leftist uh, leaning. So I will, I think, try to focus on that part more. I think we talk a lot about the, uh, uh, of how the, uh, the right usually approaches these things. So please indulge me and uh, as we hope to try to uh, discuss, critique and unsettle some of these uh, uh, issues instead of, uh, let's say, preaching to the choir. Um, so I will, for example, begin with a quote that uh, Naum Chomsky gave in a speech in 2011. And he started this quote by saying, Bahrain is about 70% Shia, and it's right across the causeway from Eastern Saudi Arabia, which is also majority Shia, and happens to be where most of the oil is. By a curious accident of history and geography, the world's major energy resources are located pretty much in Shia regions. They are a minority in the Middle East, but they happen to be where the oil is. And then he continues to analyze the region in terms of these main two categories of Sunnis and Shias. Now, disregarding the veracity of the questionable uh, information and data in there, my main concern is more that the region is how the region is primarily read through these ethno-sect uh, categories. Now, obviously, in the current post-Iraq uh, 2003 invasion, sectarianism plays an important role in the region and any analysis would have to approach this subject. But my, my concern here is that sects are made the main unit of analysis and, the, uh, and fr uh, from which basically the rest of the outlook emerges. They become basically the essence of each person is either a Shia or a Sunni and political analysis flows from that, which I think uh, is a very problematic way of approaching. And I think, uh, you know, in different areas, this has, would, uh, most people would say this. Uh, but in the Gulf, and Bahrain specifically, seems to be still the very base from which things uh, uh, emerge. Now, you might think I'm exaggerating, but, I've, uh, but I invite you to look up the last few books that have been published in Bahrain over the last two years. Um, other than the fact that the main focus is sectarianism, which I will come to, the epistemological outlook, the base from which everything is flows, is ethnosect categories. 
Now, what I want to talk about here a bit is that this actually has a long colonial legacy. And I think, too, if we're going to talk about decolonization, this would be a, at least an important part uh, to start off. I'm going to start by talking a bit about Lorimer's Gazetteer. Now, I don't know if any of you know Lorimer and the Gazetteer he wrote. So Lorimer was a colonial British officer in the British Raj who wrote probably the most famous reference in Western academia on the Gulf. More than 4,700 pages detailing as much as possible of the Gulf and the Arabian Peninsula in the early 1900s. Uh, now, although it's the main reference not used nowadays, it was back then uh, written for the purposes of colonial control through knowledge, which, as Edward Said has discussed uh, eloquently in his book, Orientalism. So Bahrain, by the early 20th century, was, the, was basically the eye of the storm of the expanding British presence in the Gulf, ever since uh, Curzon's forward policy at the end of the 19th century. Um, and Basically, this book, uh, well, it's not a book, it's actually like uh, a volume. If you look at it, Bahrain gets very uh, much more in intense and detailed treatment compared to other places. It's reflecting the, the, this, uh, the fact that basically it, was, it played a bigger role, or a big role, let's say at least, within uh, uh, the forward policy. Now, so uh, the opening uh, basically sentences when uh, uh, Lorimer discusses Bahrain is basically of the whole population of about 100,000 souls, some 60,000 chiefly townsmen are Sunnis and about 40,000 mostly villagers are Shia. Now again, disregarding the, the veracity of these statistics, uh, what most uh, is, uh, interests me here is that basically the analysis, the basic building blocks of the analysis from which everything else uh, uh, flows is basically having ethnosect cleavages, uh, which basically become the underlying fault lines that shape local society and basically its political power, practice, and discourse. So basically this uh, way of looking at things was a view of, way of, uh, of viewing and categorizing the social world in which A, there were communities. Basically they thought there were communities and these were separate communities and uh, that are clearly defined as different. And these com communities were primarily defined and composed of different sects and ethnicities. Okay. So the local population, its actions, laws, and social makeup were to be analyzed mainly based on these ethnosect uh, division, uh, which are presented you know, as very clear cut, Sunni, Sunni versus Shia, Baharna versus Ahwula versus tribes, rather than highlighting uh, you know, any kind of commonalities between them, e.g. Arab or Muslim. So then basically censuses, institution, laws, and forms of uh, mobilizations were to be organized mainly based around these ethnosect fault lines, which are elevated from everything else, whether it's class or regional place or, uh, let's say, more um, rural versus urban, etc. profession, that basically these are elevated to become the core that basically everything else flows from. So, like I said, other socioeconomic factors, kinship, uh, geography, etc., production relations, take a backseat to these different, quote, primordial elements. Uh, so obviously this does not mean these other factors did not play a role. In fact, the British uh, displayed an act for documenting the minutiae of all of the different aspects, but the basic building blocks that compose society and politics were to be distinct sects and ethnicities. Now this also, this worldview would also have real effects on the ground. Uh, where basically uh, these institutions, which I talked about uh, before, when the British started forming them, courts, uh, uh, basically city councils, uh, police forces, these uh, institutions are the ground, were formed basically with this uh, categorization based on ethnosect being taken to pri primacy and you know, setting up consociational uh, structures similar to maybe what you have in Lebanon today, uh, back in there, uh, that were based on this uh, kind of ethno-sectarian way of looking at the world. Now, this kind of outlook, I mean, with changes, obviously, of still analyzing, uh, like I said, basically analyzing Bahrain, still flow, flows from this look of having uh, 
kind of two distinct communities, Shias and Sunnis, and then different blocks of ethnicity as well uh, uh, within them. So obviously critiquing, critiquing such an, uh, an approach and the worldview through which Bahrain or the Gulf is seen is an important part maybe of if we wanted to approach decolonization of curricula or study, etc. But here is what I think is the more important part and where maybe the part of liberation comes in. The problem with such a gaze or, few, or way of approaching the place is not only that it propagates this kind of uh, way and also has material effects on the ground, but also what it hides. And importantly, uh, what are the issues that basically don't have a light shed on because we approach everything through these way. And, you know, including what I will focus on now, which will bring us, I guess, to the liberation part, is often there were anti-colonial or anti-imperial uh, or uh, more nationalist uh, uh, or even explicitly anti-sectarian movements that tried to uh, transcend such ethno-sect mobilization or label is, uh, label, uh, labeling, which basically then get trapped in this way of approaching things. So everything, whether it comes from a different outlook, nationalist, etc., is then caged within these labels. So w w uh, no matter what the person's outlook or how he approached it, it's still, oh, he's a Shia or he's a, he's a Sunni. And this is where uh, we're going to approach it. And they are projected throughout the different uh, uh, phases of, uh, of history. So this is actually what I will spend a bit of time talking about now. One of the examples of the groups that uh, no one talks about uh, at least in the Western literature, is in the same time period where the British established uh, their basically increasing presence in Bahrain in the early 20th century. And for those who might uh, you know, know what was going on in the other parts of the Arab world, this was a period of what is usually called within the literature the Al Nahda. Uh, so uh, we're talking here about people like, you know, uh, Rashid Rida or Muhammad uh, Abdur or Lafghani, etc. Uh, that basically, um, um, basically it's a, a, a new movement that uh, tried, or let's say a group uh, uh, of people of very uh, diverse leanings that basically wanted to uh, contribute or try to uh, transform some form of renaissance. So now, this also, this al Nahda, let's say, renaissance also had its reverberations within the Gulf. And within including the Gulf is Bahrain, uh, which I uh, will talk a bit more uh, now. I mean, I, this is what my, one of the main focuses are of the book that, uh, that Hisham mentioned. Um, which unfortunately, sadly, it's pretty much the first book that focuses on Bahrain. Uh, on that period and this group of people. Although there have been many books that focus on that period, but they pretty much never uh, approach this because it's always usually based on the British colonial archives and it's usually always reads things within these Sunni Shia uh, discourse, I guess, if you want. So this is, for example, one of the people who was um, one of the major figures uh, during this period. His name is uh, Qasim al-Shirawi who I always like to quote this description that the British agency and its, uh, some of its supporters would describe, quote, as a dangerous political in uh, intriguer and, quote, the cleverest rogue in Bahrain, an evil genius who spares no pain to lessen the dignity and authority of the British agency, actively promoting such seditious concepts such as the freedom of the nations. So now, <laughs> now Qasim al-Shirawi was a complex figure who uh, interacted with the Al Nahda figures in the wider Arab world. He also helped establish the first institutional, institutionalized local school and the first anti-colonial organization. But he also then, uh, and he also had different uh, uh, professions, uh, including being a merchant and then uh, the head of the custom house. And he was also close to an advisor to the ruler. So it's a very, you know, complex, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, character. Now, um, he is also uh, he is also his son. After him, became one of the main leading figures in the 1950s of the national movement. Then, and which basically, and he was in many ways in charge of uh, helping establish the 19 the first uh, 
uh, labor law in the Gulf, the 1957 Bahrain labor law. Uh, and then his, his son's son, or I guess his grandson, was also an active and important figure in the Popular Front for the liberation of the occupied Arabian Gulf, as it was called, uh, the Popular Front in, in the Gulf in the 1970s. So this was kind of like a family that had about you know, three generations, uh, at least, of people who are involved in, in politics. Now, now, on the other hand, I mean, just to give you an example, um, so one of the most recent books in Bahrain, which basically, like a lot of the other books, focuses nearly exclusively on the British colonial archives when approaching things, uh, in this period where he's involved, he gets a treatment of a few sentences, uh, where he's basically just uh, reduced to a Sunni tribal affiliate. Now, disregarding that anyone knows much about Bahrain would tell you that his family is not a tribal family. Uh, but even then, basically, this complex ca uh, character was basically reduced to a you know, treacherous Sunni who was deported by the British. Uh, now, this might not necessarily come out of you know, malicious intent, but you know, if you completely depend on the British archives and basically the uh, viewpoint that comes from, uh, uh, from basically British colonial officers, no matter how critical you are of the archives, you will not get this other information that would give you this different viewpoint of, uh, uh, of where he comes from. And you end up basically applying the ethno-sectarian gaze, I guess as you call it. He's basically a tribal Sunni. That's all he is. So basically, uh, this is what I tried to, uh, tried to talk about a bit uh, uh, as well in terms of uh, how we can uh, uh, approach this. Now comes in, we'll bring in the Palestine part. Uh, because it is actually from these movements and those tied to them uh, that basically uh, the legacy or I guess the long movement of Palestinian solidarity in the Gulf began to take root, which stretches uh, back to the 1920s. Indeed, the Gulf-Palestine connections and solidarities have been sold, sold, seldom explored within the Western uh, literature. In fact, it's nearly, uh, you know, it's, it's very, very uh, minute and which we'll come to now. And again, this is another area where the entrenched Orientalism on the Gulf on some of today's politics are reflected historically. There isn't, uh, yeah, there hasn't been much, but I mean, it's also important to consider what has been there. So, Probably, uh, you know, uh, one of the most important figures that have uh, uh, wrote on this, the very few that has written on this, is uh, Rosemary Saeed Zahlan, who, uh, you know, has not, I think, taken her due enough uh, within the work on the Gulf uh, for the work and she has done. And she's probably, you know, more her, known for her connection as well to her brother, Edward Saeed. Uh, that is not known as so much, but she's one of, uh, well, yeah, she was one of the most foremost scholars uh, on the Gulf. Um, and we also, you know, are lucky here to have uh, as well Talal Rashud with us, who is probably the best uh, expert on this uh, of the early Gulf uh, and Palestine uh, connections, uh, which is, uh, you know, he uh, explores these surprisingly rich connections starting from the 1920s up until today. So, you know, we can, and this, again, his work has explored this much more, so I encourage you to, to look at it more. Um, so, for example, in 1924, during the British mandate, and after the League of Nations authorized uh, Jewish migration to Palestine, uh, Amin al Haj Amin al Husseini headed, headed a delegation from the Supreme Muslim Council that visited Kuwait and Bahrain to, read, to raise funds for the upkeep of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And this was during a phase when the Palestinian national movement first started to seek uh, support for uh, this cause. And this pr pretty much continued throughout all the major, I guess, uh, events that uh, uh, you could look for. So, for example, this became more crystallized during the Arab Re uh, Great Arab Revolt between 1936 and 1939. And uh, Kuwait, if we take an example of a place that probably had the most pro-Palestine work during this time. Uh, I mean, remember during this time, pretty much all of the Gulf, with the exception of Saudi, was under uh, one form or another of British colonialism. Uh, and so needless to say, usually this kind of work went together with uh, also anti-colonial work against the British. The British were nervous of these kind of repercussions uh, elsewhere. So usually 
for example, in this period, it focuses it focuses more on clandestine collection of funds and arms smuggling, and uh, which w was done uh, in Kuwait. And they also uh, established in 1936 a committee to assist the Palestinians. Um, and they also then started basically they created a, a group called Shabab al Kuwait or the Youth of Kuwait that also uh, tried to uh, basically. Uh, they sent telegrams of protest to the League of Nations, the House of Commons, and the Secretary of State for the Colonies. Uh, and then basically also they set up a committee specifically to raise uh, funds for these issues. And these same people, a lot of them would form the, uh, the backbone for the 1938 constitutional movement, oppositional movement in, uh, in Kuwait. So, and I mean, this continues. So again, we could go again to uh, 1948 and the riots that happened in Bahrain uh, during uh, or in response to Al-Nakba. And, you know, of course, then once we enter the 1950s, it becomes much more of a uh, nationalist oriented movement. So this is, for example, probably from one of the biggest movements in Bahrain, which was called the Higher, the Higher Executive Committee in the 1950s which basically in the end was, uh, was, was, which up until then was the biggest political movement uh, in the history of Bahrain. They even forced recognition as a political party. And it was then sent to its deathbed in 1956 following protests uh, against the, basically the tripartite aggression uh, by Britain and Israel and France against Egypt. And the, its leaders were exiled and sent to uh, St. Helena by the British, uh, well, jailed and then exiled, where uh, uh, at least some of them continued the rest of their lives. Um, by the way, the, the guy in the middle there uh, holding the microphone, that's my grandfather. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, now, this again, we can also you know, once we enter the 1960s, once there is the turn, let's say, towards the more revolutionary movements, and then you have, you have first the movement of Arab nationalists and then the Popular Front as they took a leftist turn. Uh, this also continued uh, in the Gulf and with the connections in Palestine, even through the name, the Popular Front, right? And uh, in fact, as we all know, one of the main founders of the movement of uh, Arab nationalists with George Habesh and Naif Hawatma was uh, Dr. Ahmed Al Khatib. From, from Kuwait. And indeed, this connection went both ways. So, um, you know, uh, many of the people that then came in, uh, through uh, during the Palestinian Revolution of the 1960s and 1970s were in Kuwait, like Yasser Arafat, Ghassan Kanafani, and Najil Ali. Indeed, Hamdallah, the famous cartoon figure, appeared first in, the, in a Kuwaiti newspaper, as Siyasa, in 1969. Uh, and obviously also we can also discuss the more uh, Islamist uh, groups such as Hamas and this uh, connection. Now needless to say there are also several issues of critique that came up within these movements uh, as was the case with the visa restrictions immortalized by Ghassan Kanafani in his novel Men of the Sun about three Palestinians who want to be smuggled into Kuwait and end up dying in the process. Now uh, and this is important. Uh, but what I'm saying here is not about, you know, touting the Gulf's horn or trying to, you know, present a, a different uh, picture or that, oh, the Gulf has a bad deal and how it's uh, being portrayed uh, or pushing against lazy narratives, etc. Et there is actually a deeper reason, which again is to come back to this, is to uncover and reclaim these movements and this history, which is being buried and forgotten and it becomes a more of a disconnect, not only in the West, which is, I guess, didn't, there wasn't even the connection to begin with, but also in the, uh, in the Gulf and in the Arab world. Um, and here I can also invoke the work of two other great people who have, I think, given lectures here in Fobzo before, uh, Karman Nabusi and Abdel Razak Takriti, who basically emphasize that at the core of this is traditions, traditions of solidarity, traditions of different movements and how they approach uh, their outlook to politics and how they approach uh, different things. So, you know, an, an, anti uh, an anti-colonial tradition, a more liberation tradition, a nationalist tradition, etc. So, 
the, and the, many of the Gulf uh, movements built uh, that, or that uh, emerged in the Gulf throughout these periods, Palestine and uh, the struggle of the Palestinians was a fundamental part of the outlook and view and the traditions uh, of these peoples. Indeed, to, in some cases, going to the core of them, such as with the Popular Front, with the movement of Arab nationalists, etc. And, you know, these traditions are important to, uh, again, critique, uncover, and, uh, and talk about it. And here, again, is the part where we'll bring it to, uh, uh, to today. And maybe we'll also talk about, you know, potential synergies and uh, ways of solidarity, maybe uh, when we're trying to approach the West or the Gulf or the Arab world, etc. Um, so, for example, it's no secret, I would argue today, that you know, Palestine-related uh, work has uh, been facing setbacks in the Arab world over the last uh, two decades, uh, not only with the normalization of regimes uh, and governments, of which the Gulf now seems to uh, be, or at least some countries in the Gulf seem to be taking a leading role, but also on the uh, level of people, where, uh, again, organized movements have been facing setbacks. Now, this has, seems to have coincided with the rise in Palestine-related solidarity work in the, in the West, uh, showing uh, diverging uh, movements. Now, so maybe if one tries to uh, talk about this in the end, a bit to, of how to be able to approach this and where maybe there can be a benefit. So for example, we all know that now as part of the decolonization uh, framework that is being used, and again, I, I prefer to say anti-colonialism or liberation, but we'll come to that. You have works of greats like Franz Fanon and Ghassan Kanafani, which were part of uh, how Palestine and other uh, places under colonial rule uh, are now part and included in many curricula in Western universities. Um, and obviously we have, you know, the works of Edward Said, etc., uh, uh, playing a role uh, in this. But we need to take this, I think, beyond this and to try to basically look at, like I just mentioned and others have mentioned, into looking at anti-colonial and trying to bring to the center these uh, movements and the way that they have approached. But this, you know, cross, I guess, fertilization, if you want to call it, can go also go the other way. And, you know, productively and not, you know, if we always talk about imperialism the, of the West of the Arab world, also we can maybe talk about the work of solidarity movements can also help, you know, uh, you know and uh, again, work together with those in the region and vice versa. So I, for example, um, a lot of the, um, I guess, work that I got involved in in, uh, in Palestine happened in the West. And in fact, in university, uh, you know, whether it was, uh, you know, being involved in Israel Apartheid Week or the occupation movement in, what was it, 2008? I don't know, that was a long time ago. Anyway, <laughs> that all happened, you know, when I was, uh, uh, here. And, you know, I got, you know, introduced to the idea of, like, you know, uh, demonstrations, vigils, uh, boycott campaigns, etc. Now, these obviously existed as well back, uh, back at home, but they took different forms. Um, so, you know, these new discourses, strategies, tactics, friendships, traditions cross-pollinated with the ones I had at home and still animate much of what I do today. Indeed, uh, I met my wife <laughs> through Palestine-related uh, uh, work. And so, for example, she and those who uh, work with her were the first to do uh, Israel Apartheid Week in the Gulf uh, and have one of the most active groups on Palestine working in the Gulf nowadays. So, now, obviously, again, this comes with cautions and pitfalls and uh, critiques such that what might apply in the West may not apply in the Gulf and vice versa. And for example, the bar historically has been much higher in the Arab world. Uh, um, so for example, when we're talking, you know, uh, 1967 borders that would be considered, you know, uh, 
uh, normalization or, uh, you know, not, not good enough in a lot of uh, uh, the movements that were uh, in the Gulf. Um, and that where basically liberation is, is uh, or uh, freedom is the main uh, goal of, of Palestine and Palestinians and everyone who lives uh, on the land of, uh, of Palestine. Now, now, let's try to, you know, to bring uh, all of these different divergent themes that I've tried to talk about uh, together. So I began with talking about the colonial imprint in the Gulf and the need to recognize it and critique it and... Uh, and the imprint it still leaves on the region today, not only on its foreign relations, but also on its internal structures, and as well on the, the way the Gulf is approached in academia and more widely uh, in the West. And I tried to connect this and show that this has actually a long colonial tradition. Uh, so, you know, us the usual canned categories that you get when dealing with the Gulf or the Arab world, we might want to, you know, rethink them. And uh, because these can shape a whole project and the premise from, and a discourse from which they emerge and obviously uh, the material effects that come from this. And then we tried to talk about how this also hides other readings and movements, which had a more anti-colonial liberatory trajectory, which get, you know, uh, hidden uh, through this. Uh, and we took the, uh, you know, the Al Nahva group as an example, and we tried to explore through this the connections with Palestine from then uh, and the Gulf up until uh, uh, the, the uh, current times and how these also can get hidden and uh, you know, put aside. But also, so we want to reach a point where we you know, can talk about them and highlight them and maybe build uh, 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 on them. And how maybe this can reflect on how can there be a productive interplay on the, based on the traditions of solidarity uh, on Palestine, uh, whether it's in the West or in the Gulf or the Arab world, which could, you know, work with each other and not only bring in new outlooks, interpretations, readings, but offer ways to build further and open up different ways of uh, and sol uh, traditions of solidarity. Because this is, at the end, what is important, uh, building traditions of solidarity towards the goal of a free Palestine. Thank you very much. Thank you.